Today I'm covering a little bit of footage from uh, the end of May, actually. We, uh, as part of having forest land, one of the advantages that we have is that we get to go to uh, or get notified about all kinds of different forestry training and uh, different classes and just various resources for forest owners, which is pretty cool. This particular one was actually a shiitake mushroom growing class, and they were dedicating, like, the, the uh, University of Washington has been doing, uh, the last four years, doing studies on how to grow wild raised or forest grown uh, shiitake mushrooms. So there's actually a, a process that uh, is it was created in Japan, has been used for hundreds of years uh, to har harvest or to grow and harvest shiitake mushrooms. Uh, they found there's people don't know who um, don't recall who uh, have implemented that particular system pretty well with only minor modifications in uh, the U.S. on the East Coast. Uh, where they have a lot, uh, fairly different weather than we do. Um, and so they've been trying to figure out how to do that and take advantage of our forests and the fact that we have, uh, you know, a, a lot of rain here on the, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So this particular uh, group of the universities has been studying that, and they have come to the conclusion that it was time to start sharing that uh, and they we went through everything about the process of doing this so they they and and, and I do have to apologize but I, I figured the audio um, since it was a class that you had to pay for and whatnot um, I didn't want to step on anybody's toes and create any potential problems so that's why the audio is there but you can see here in these logs there are all these little uh, dimples and drill holes and fill them with wax and then they use these bins to give them a soak for a couple of days to make sure the log is is prepared uh, because on the on the east coast they have more moist summers than we do here on the west coast and so we had to be able to handle that uh, these are some of the stacked logs that they have uh, prepared. They have each each pallet is is a different experiment um, that they've been running to try and figure out how to how to do this. So normally the when you do this you do it in a controlled room and you would inoculate the log and let it sit in a moisture controlled room. And, this is how they end up stacking them when they're ready to, to fruit. Um, they soak them again for, I think, a week is what he said, just to make sure they're totally soaked through. And then you stack them on end so the mushrooms can actually grow out. And then you cover it with this uh, fabric to protect it from bugs and, and wind and such. Um, and so what they're doing, what we're going over is the basic setup of the property trying to you know make sure it's north facing protected from wind is one of the bigger issues that they went over and and then once it's you know fruiting protecting it from bugs because bugs like to eat mushrooms so that's what they're they're doing here and then we walked around the forest and we talked about different tree types different things apparently alder uh, red alder is one of the best growing options that they have found here. There's a few others that are decent um, that we went over and talked about and then a lot that they have not tried yet. Um, so since we have a bunch of small ash we're gonna hopefully try those because they're gonna be coming down um, and we're hoping to see if we can't save some of the smaller ones for uh, trying to grow some mushrooms out of it. Uh, we don't have our our setup here on our property uh, completed yet, but the the a lot of the questions pertained uh, specifically to 
how to safely harvest the trees. Um, one of the things that was surprising to me was to they, they very strongly recommended not using machinery to harvest the trees at when once you cut them. And I kind of thought at the time, you know, I, that doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm sure I can pick up the, the trees and get them moved a little bit so that I can I don't have to like pick them up by hand and and the problem was that every time you touch it with the machinery it, it destroys the bark and you weaken the the ability for that particular log to allow only the chosen mushroom to grow and over the summer as I've been moving things I've noticed pretty good even if even when I'm super careful and it's a small log I just grabbing them with those those claws is pretty dangerous if that's your goal is to not disturb the bark so this is the actual inoculation area um, and this is a kind of a cool process so you pick up your log you set it over here they've got a couple of different uh, ways of measuring it and then you bring it over and and you, you drill your holes in that spot and then you bring it over here and they've got a two stations two sides to the station one where you uh, do the actual inoculation of putting the um, it's sawdust and, and you know mycelium. Um, the tool that they use to do this is actually pretty sweet. It's it's this strange little adapter on the end of an angle grinder, uh, and then the other one of the other tools that you use is this hand plunger device that you use to stuff the bottom with a bunch of the mycelium sawdust and then you stick it in the hole you just drilled and push down on the plunger and it jams that little plug into the log and then you'll seal it off um, they've got some really interesting little discs that are designed to kind of indicate this based on the size of the log how many lines down the outside you should try and get uh, the bigger the log the more rows of uh, of inoculation holes you get. Uh, there's a little bit better view of, of plugging the holes. Uh, but you don't want a log that's too big or it becomes unwieldy and difficult to move and especially once it's you know loaded with water after you've given it a soak. All that water weight makes it hard so they, they recommended not uh, anything smaller than four inches and not anything bigger than I think it was nine inches, eight or nine inches, which was kind of surprising. Um, but you know they're all about four-ish feet long. That's that's the goal, and you can apparently fruit these anywhere up to two or three years, at, at, and having them fruit uh, three times a year. So you let the you let the mycelium sit for the first year, so that it can just inoculate the log. And you start that with a soak so that it has enough moisture in there that the mycelium will survive through the hot, dry summers out here. And then that next spring, you soak the log again, and a couple weeks later, you get the, the shiitake mushrooms fruiting, and then you can harvest. And then uh, four months later, you can do that again, and four months later, you can do that again, and and then and you can do that, like I said, for two or three years. So once you've inoculated your log, then you kind of roll it over here to this other station. And they've got a bunch of different tools to be able to do this. The The tool that was kind of universally decided to be the best was either with a measuring cup and a little brush or just a turkey baster. Um, the little plunger syringe things worked okay, but they were more messy than anything else. Um, I personally actually preferred just doing it with a foam brush and a and a you know measuring cup to hold it um, but you go down your down your row cover it and roll it and cover the next row and roll it and cover the next row and when you get to that last that first row again you're done and, and you've got yourself an inoculated log so then you go set it somewhere to protect it from the rain and sorry not rain from the wind you don't want that to dry out too much. It was a pretty cool, um, pretty cool time. We we actually enjoyed the class. We enjoyed the information. And so, 
we've got that going. This is now the grading blade that we thought was going to be a good deal. I picked that up when I got the mill and was super excited to try it so that I could do some actual grading on our property. And it turned out that this particular design, having this plate behind a groove with bolts, doesn't, in my opinion, work. It, it's horrible design. Um, so here's the here's the blade, and you've got this C channel that's welded to it, and under that C channel you've got a plate that is supposed to be attached to the uh, the actual mount for the three point harness, and that I could never ever get it tight, and so that mat mounts to the back of this, and I cranked down and cranked down and got it as tight as I could, and I thought that was great, and I went and and started working and a few, after a few minutes of box or excuse me grading it wasn't doing very well and I would look back and the it was loose and it would flop around um, I tried fixing that and, and I, I kid you not I got about two hours of grading and then I I was up I'll, sh I'll show a picture in a minute um, but I was I was up there working on a spot uh, there were no roots. There was no rocks. It was it was stuff that had already been box bladed and cleaned up. I was just trying to get a bit more of a, a ditch there. And this is what I was telling you about. I mean, it's it's mostly graded already. I was just trying to smooth that out and pull a little bit out of the out of that ditch to to lessen the severity of the ditch. And that I heard a a loud pop. Um, I scared the crud out of me. And uh, this is the actual spot where I where it broke, um, and it, and it just it, I looked back and and there was no more blade on the on the device. So we ended up returning that, and we'll be getting another one. But if you're in the market for a grading blade, I I would definitely recommend against that that particular variety. So thank you for watching. Uh, Stay safe. God bless.